Okay. Let's get this. Let me take a sip of this golden well, nectar before we start. Before we get started, we are WT Data and Facts, and today we're going to have a little discussion. Mostly, I'm going to ask Don Lewis some questions, my husband. About, Thank you, Stephanie Jones. About the decline in registrations in USA Taekwondo. Okay. But before that, this is uh, this is Don Lewis, and uh, we're going to have this discussion. So, Don, why don't you tell us about yourself? Okay. My name is Don Lewis. I am 65 years old, a young 65, if I say myself. I'm a dual Canadian and American citizen. And my career was really as a geologist in the gold mining industry, where I spent over 20 years uh, searching, discovering, and acquiring gold mines around the world in over 20 different countries, and uh, had a fabulous time. We actually found at least four gold mines, I'll say. And yeah, we found uh, the one, one or two in Eureka, Nevada. Yeah, correct? we found two deposits in Eureka, Nevada. And he, I, he discovered a gold mine, people. <laughs> And Literally, I named, I named since it was Eureka, Nevada. I named it Archimedes. After east the famous, and West, right? East and West. After the famous Greek uh, mathematician. That's very interesting. Yeah. So, what got you in, interested in Taekwondo and uh, collecting all this data and doing all this sports analysis for the for the, the Taekwondo community? Okay. Well, ten years ago, I married Stephanie Jones, who is my wife, and she is a fitness and training and nutrition expert. Uh, you can and ask I'm a published her, author. A published author, yes, bodybuilder, uh, and uh, very accomplished business owner. I'm a very lucky man. But so, what's that got so, to do with Taekwondo? Okay, so <laughs> Stephanie Jones has a, uh, at the time, 10 years ago, had a 12 year old daughter uh, named Summer, who at that time even was a second degree black belt. Yes, she was. And, but she hadn't really sparred. And I ended up adopting Summer. Yes, legally. And, legally adopting her actually we got married and so taekwondo became our life we were doing taekwondo yeah. pretty close to seven days a week uh going to dojangs with official instruction in our gym <clears throat> doing training working out uh, all the rest of that stuff going to tournaments and events and so summer one was very ambitious she wanted to go to the olympics like uh, a lot of uh high-end sparring taekwondo of use like to aim for. And so we collaborated with many coaches, didn't we? Many coaches. Uh, well, well, the problem was there weren't a lot of girls her size or age in Las Vegas area. Right, we lived in there Las was, Vegas. There were some sparring schools, but the school that she had spent four years at was more of a Pumse school, and Summer was excellent at Pumse. She did that first and then got into sparring right. later. So, so we started to do some travel, local and distant. Well, you you mostly. Yeah. I was well, running yeah. the spa that we, we owned. We both <laughs> did some of it, and I did a lot of it. So we collaborated with you know coaches like Jimmy Kim in California, yeah. uh, who was working with Gene, Steven, and Diana Lopez at the time. So we yeah. spent quite a bit of time with them. Uh, ultimately, with Paul Green and Gareth Brown in Manchester and yeah. throughout the Western states, where they had numerous events. We were the common denominator at most of those events. Yeah, Texas, uh, California. And then Summer got, was interested in the U.S. Army's WCAP program, which is the World Class, As World Class Athlete, Athlete program. program. And who was the coach of that? That was David Bartlett and Terrence time, Jennings. Yeah. Terrence Jennings. Terrence came on along with a number of athletes. Uh, and she spent uh, over a year working and training yeah. with them in various times and mostly in Colorado Springs at altitude. Yep, she, uh, she'd fly out there and stay at either an Airbnb or with actually some of the sergeants in the program that, yeah. were, tra that were the trainers. And we got to be, know them really well. They came and stayed with us at our house in Las yeah. Vegas for the U.S. Open. Four-year Delta. And uh, had, a, had a blast. We learned a lot about uh, a lot of things. And maybe they did too. Well, yeah, we had all three sergeants stay, stay with us. We did. And then one of them stayed a whole week, Sergeant Michael Rushing. Right. Yeah, and then he worked with Summer quite a bit too. Yeah, we got some video of that. Yeah. And then we also did some work with Ed Gibbons, who moved to Las Vegas. He's CJ Nicholas's dad. Yeah. And Ed takes a lot of, uh, uh, is, is earned a lot of credit for training CJ to be the uh, incredible sure athlete and Taekwondo fighter that he is. And he's also the kind of silent guy in the background that keeps most of these uh, WT tournaments going. Yeah. Like the, uh, the 
fight offs, the team trial fight offs right. that just occurred. Yeah. And if you if anyone noticed, Master Gibbons in the background walking papers too. That's why there's well, most of them were on different rings that they shouldn't have been on, but everything continued to flow because of and they were ahead of schedule. Yeah, they were. That, so, that was, so good for them. Yep. So one of the things we learned uh, amongst so many things was that coaching at events is a big deal and we tried out many coaches and they're expensive and they become expensive and so we were spending a lot of money thousands thousands and thousands of dollars we actually sold a uh, sporty BMW. bmw car to be able to afford some of the travel and events that we went to and coaches and uh Great and coaches. the coaches who were hundreds of dollars per event so so we earned our black belts and we both became coaches. I became First Summer's yep. primary ring coach. Yep. And so we went together to US team trials, to US nationals, to numerous state and local events, can't even count them all, and to G1 and G2 events. The US Open, the Canadian Open, the Costa Rica Open, and the Austrian Open. So that all took place over a six or seven year period. And we and had a great time. We should probably give Summer some credit because even as a junior, she won the Canadian Open. Yes, oh. as a junior, she won the Canadian Open. She medaled at the uh, Pan American Open the, as a as a G one event. Yeah, that was so, like twenty nineteen. Yeah, and then in twenty nineteen, Summer had uh, let's call it an interesting experience in that uh, she wanted to go to the Olympics, of course, but she also wanted to go to major events. And so in twenty nineteen, she ended up being the alternate on the World University Team the world team, world, the national team to go to the worlds for the US and the Pan American Games alternate. So she, she was second place, which doesn't get you very far, uh, in 2019 and virtually everything. So anyway, 2019 was the last year she really competed. And uh, since then, we've been doing uh, data analysis and compilation about Taekwondo to keep ourselves busy. Yeah, well, so yeah, she retired, and, yeah. um, but we still love Taekwondo and, and we love, especially Don doing the sports analysis. That's his, his forte. I, I prefer, you know, focusing on like nutrition, the legalese and, um, you know, the documentation of. Yeah. And keep him, the, keep him the honest, keep him the honest <laughs> about my data collection. Yeah, exactly. We both do data collection. It, yeah, and I, I more prefer like, let's read the rules and how yeah. do we standardize something and improve it. Um, so, but what I want to talk about today with you, because um, you just made an interesting post on our Facebook site, WT Data and Facts, about the decline in um, registrations. Is it just for women, female uh, seniors, or is it also male seniors? It's for Big all, for obviously black all senior U.S. athletes over the last decade, from 2013, uh, the start of the PSS system, really, through to today, 2023, over that decade, with a couple year gap because they didn't have events in, in uh, 21 or 22, uh, there's been a fairly, very significant decline in participation by seniors at the US Open, which is the premier event in the United States each year, uh, by both males and females. There's actually been an up and down, but more or less down trend for juniors and cadets as well. We don't really track the juniors and cadets too closely, but we do for nationals. And at nationals, there's also an alarming trend at US nationals for cadets, juniors, and seniors all to be having kind of plummeting attendance and participation levels. So that doesn't seem to be uh, too great a trend for US Taekwondo. So well, what was, uh, talk about some of the statistics in okay. your post today. You know, what were the, the numbers, like right. say at the US Open, Sure. Um, I don't know if you looked at other tournaments, right. you know, where, where it's also declined. And okay. Well, at the U.S. Open, right now, uh, the U.S. Open is uh, two weeks away, and registration is open, late registration is open for another six days until the 21st uh, at around 11 o'clock Pacific time. And uh, so we know the numbers as of today, this morning, and they were alarming. So the numbers, three, four years ago at the US Open for US athletes was around uh, 80 to 100 uh, women and 130 to 150 men. 
And so today uh, we learned that there's only 43 U.S. women registered for the U.S. Open. And there's about 130 to 140 internationals, of which there's 27 Canadians. So Canada is, you know, about one-tenth of the size of the uh, United States. Yeah. And they've got almost the same number of Taekwondo athletes, female Taekwondo they athletes. They have more than, than half. Yeah. Yeah. They got 27 to our 43. What's going on with that? Well, what, what about the men? The men? Uh, Is it about this? It was a, it's a similar decline. Uh, the men, I'm going to have to go off the top of my head because I've got my chart in front of me. I believe it's around 95. Uh, you can correct me if I've got the number Let's see if I can right. pull it up. I should have been more prepared. Around, I should have been prepared too. Around 95 U.S. men versus normal, you know, 50% more than that. So the high water mark for women was, I believe, in 2017 at the U.S. Open when there was twice as many female participants. And these are the participants that appeared in the ring and ended up on the brackets. So here we've got some actual data where, did I see the other one? This is the Canadian versus American. Okay. So for guys, we talked about the women, that's not it. There that, it is, that it? there it is. Okay. okay, so let's get the actual numbers. I was pretty close with my guesstimation. So US senior men, as of this morning, 96 were registered, uh, which would be significantly lower than the lowest ever. The lowest ever at the US Open was 2020 in Orlando. People don't like going anywhere than Las Vegas. So in Orlando, there was 108 males, now there's 96. The most in the last 10 years was 177 men in 2013. Uh, as recently as 2018, there was 141. So you can see that there's like a 40% plus drop in men and women is, is even worse. 86 at the uh, 2017 US Open that appeared on brackets and only 43 registrants today. Internationals are back up. Internationals in uh, the last time in Las Vegas at two, uh, in 2019, 177 men, there's 194 today and 124 women and there's 135 today. So international men and women are still coming to Las Vegas in particular in the United States for the US Open but there's this pretty alarming trend downwards in uh, senior participation at the U.S. Open. For, with, of Americans? Of Americans. Yeah, Americans. Yeah. So why do you think that is? Well, I mean, what's going on? There's a number of uh, factors and normal- I, mean, I guess we don't know why, but we don't we're, know why. We're, we're making so, an educated guess. So now we're not doing data uh, compilation. We're kind of speculating about the data. And so this is, there's yeah. a normal trend where, especially in the United States and probably throughout the world, where when juniors in particular uh, graduate high school and you then go to work or go to college or both, uh, they tend to drop out of the Taekwondo world. But that's not new. Uh, and they do that because they have to make money, they have to study, uh, they're busy, they've got a social life that's different to when they're teens because they're adults. And, uh, but that, hasn't, that is not a new thing, either in Taekwondo or society. And so something else is going on. And so- Do you think it has to do with the, you know, the pandemic and- Well, you know- Kind of changed our culture a little bit for a couple of years or? There, you could make a good argument for that. During the uh, lockdowns related to the, the big flu we had, uh, the big flu scare, uh, the lockdowns prevented most Taekwondo uh, dojangs from even opening. And they are one of the last two open because of the very physical and intimate nature, intimate meaning, close contact uh, of the athletes and participants. So there was that shutdown that was definitely a factor. But we hear from people who run dojangs that their rates of uh, members are actually up from 2019. So especially the young people, uh, the parents, perhaps want to get their kids back into shape after, you know, being on the couch and out of school for a year or two. Uh, they got into the gym. And so that seems to be increasing. You don't have hard data on that, but that's the, that's the qualitative information we have that the Dojang uh, membership is up. And so it's not really that. Well, 
Now, what do you think about AAU? Because we're hearing there's a lot of schools, um, you know, this is just chatter. Right. Um, but that the cost of doing these tournaments is increasing. Their time in the ring is less. And USAT, you know, this is how some people feel. You know, I don't know how you would prove it, but and they feel like that USAT doesn't really care about a lot of the athletes. Right. Whether they can, you know, well, make it or not. But whereas we hear other opinions that AAU uh, tends to develop athletes better right. than USAT. But you still have to work with USAT because that is, that's the feed in to, you know, they going to the, the Olympics. Uh, um, they have control of who gets to go to the Olympics. And uh, other tournaments. Like well, yeah, Worlds, yeah. Worlds, Panning Games. Uh -huh. USAT is the uh, official uh, right. designated party responsible for that. So you have to work, we have to work with. Right. AEU is a great organization. It is. We know a number of the people involved. Mm -hmm. We went to several events. We were actually went to the Southern California events because yep. Nevada was part of that. Yep. And I had a great time. Uh, some of the events were a little smaller, um, but generally highly comparable. Yeah, that's and, several years ago. I think, yeah. I think it's a lot different now. It and could be. Um, and, a, and a number of athletes that we know did both. Well, yeah. yeah. And I think some, a lot still do. Right. And so that would be a great question for those people that did both. Is, you know, how do they feel about AEU versus WT? You know, you asked a great question there. I made a comment that, that some people feel that that USA Taekwondo doesn't really care about the states and you know individual uh, masters who run schools, and you know there may be some evidence for that because they keep changing the way they uh, have their pathways to that you is know, true. membership on all these teams, world team, U.S. national team, etc. Uh, and so they keep changing the rules. And they keep, they appear to be keep changing the rules to benefit themselves with their very specific objectives on which athletes they want to select and earn the spot on these teams. It's always been that way though. Yeah. It seems like, with it, remember there was the whole point chasing. Yeah. If you had enough points, We were involved in that. Yeah, we had to go to arbitration because, uh, you know. Yeah, let's not get into that. Too. All right, but anyway, the, the point system showed one thing and, and they wanted to pick someone else and uh, but you know, well, plus they, now they do the fight off. Yeah. Well, like plus that was uh, that was back game. in the day in 2018, 19, where they had the the black ops team, where they were basically secretly funding a yeah. select group of around less than a dozen. But that's actually a fact. Six and a dozen. Oh, not, it's, that's not that's speculation. Not a speculation even, that was a fact. They even bragged about it being called the black ops team. Yeah. Uh, so the black ops team were funded, and that's a that's by, the biggest part of this whole by thing. By USAT. By USAT. Uh, while well, they were doing without the, any justification, uh, they just well, they were still picked. putting on these uh, 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 talent uh, talent ID talent ID camps. Sure, that were like three hundred dollars. Sure, that was each. a money raising. They're always money raising yeah. exercises, and so uh, you know they they wanted specific athletes to succeed, and in large part they achieved that, and they've had some success. Let's not take that away from them. No, um, so. I don't want to turn this into a gripe session. Okay. You know, we want to stick to data and facts, um, but sometimes you got to give your opinion because <laughs> don't stop advertising those. Uh, so let me ask you this: How do you think we can improve? I mean, obviously we're not USAT. Wow. Uh, we we don't have control of USAT. Wow. Um, but what could we do? Uh, how could we expose or what information? I mean, I just feel like this, we need to have like a collaboration of more people with a voice. That sounds like you need a group to collaborate to have the big voice. Yeah. But anyway, we could start with, let's brainstorm a little bit. And so- How do we improve this? <laughs> how do we improve? And so like more participation, more satisfaction basically, yeah, which make, leads to make the participation. Game, make the game funner to watch, funner to compete. Oh, the whole Taekwondo. Well, that's what- Yeah. That's a, opinion, my opinion. Right. I think, you know, when when more people want to watch, yeah, you're going to have more money thrown at it. Right. They could, they already are creating more money, but they don't, they have volunteer referees. Yes. Who does that in a, in right. a professional sport? Right. Why aren't there uh, paid referees that are standardized 
that all make decisions very similar to each other, not like Guadalajara world, uh, where they never called running away at all. You know, it was very Especially to certain athletes from certain nations. It, it, yes, it what? seems, it was, me. it was very biased. And then, you know, whereas like um, the Pan Am finals, you know, the, they had, the referees were different groups, a different group, and they, uh, the calls weren't as noticeable, which okay. to me means it's better. Okay, so I'm gonna throw out some wild and crazy ideas okay. and, and give credit where credit's due. Okay. So I think some of the recent changes are fabulous. And I think we agree on the, the two out of three rounds, uh, rounds is a huge improvement. I, I, I know a lot of people disagree. But, Ooh, I don't care, I think it's great. It's, it, makes the, it makes it more interesting. It's to, more interesting. It's Other, more interesting rather to than, watch on an objective scale. Yeah. Did you ever watch male heavyweights on a three round total point system? They'd stand there and stand there it's and stand good. there. And at the very end, maybe there'd be a flurry. Now, there's a flurry every round. Yeah. The big guys doing double kicks and uh, head kicks right out of the gate. I love it. Okay, that's okay. one. So that's what a else? good thing. So we've noticed that there's a huge disparity in awarding valid punches. And so we've heard that Dato and maybe KPNP are coming up with a, a partial electronic system for awarding punches, but it's partial in the sense that it might register within a square on a chest. Oh, that was a valid yeah, punch. Yeah, it's only valid. It still has to be validated by the corner judges. Yeah. So forget that. It's still subjective. There has to be. And it's subjective to a volunteer ref. That, yeah. That gets maybe per diem. Right. So those refs need some sort of motivation to get up out of their chair so they can yeah. see what's going on. Maybe they shouldn't have chairs in the corners. And that's between good, rounds, they could go idea. sit down. No, you're standing up. Like some of them actually do stand up and walk because they can't see what's going on. And so they stand up, walk around so you can see, because usually points are awarded when it's in the right line of sight of the two judges. Yeah. So forget that. Move those judges around. Tell them to award punches, you know, unless it's a bad punch. Unless it misses, it's not very strong. It's a feeble, you know, weak wrist, limp wrist kind of, oh, punch. You know, don't do that. Well, so and so punches, gam johns. Yeah, gam johns. They went, they went from being a, a point deduction, right? Yeah, you know, because it's supposed to be a penalty, to awarding the a point to the. I like that. To the uh, opposite athlete. Right. But but what it does, it gives it the same amount of um, points as a punch. Right. And this is a quan. Quan right. is punching. Right. Tai quan. It's not tai. Right. So we, we compile data Gamjongdo. and it, are, are punches and gamjongs important? Yes, they are. We compile data by every weight class, weight class uh, male and female at the Riyadh Grand Prix, Prix for almost every fight. So for yeah. a statistically balanced, you know, I think it was a minimum of 12 uh, fights per uh, division of the eight divisions. We compiled, you know, uh, obviously kicking and head kicks and head kick protests awarded, denied. Uh, we also captured punches, you know, mm -hmm. attempted, awarded, and, and gamjongs. We it's still more work to compile, you know, which kind of gamjongs, but we have a subjective view on which ones. But anyway, gamjongs are nearly twenty percent of all the points athletes get, especially in the heavyweights. They're more. Yeah. Punches are also around fifteen percent. There's a third or more of all points being given out subjectively by the two corner refs judging punches. Yeah. And the guy in the middle in you know, assigning gamjong. Yep. And you know the gamjong that's most overused that everybody believes? Holding. Holding. And then, then of course that neg negates points, usually head kicks, uh, because of holding. Also, monkey kicks. Monkey kicks are actually allowed, and scorpion kicks are allowed, but you can't be touching the other person's hogu. Tell that to anybody judging the Iranians. The Iranians are on there grabbing and kicking and doing monkey kicks, they're all scoring. Go follow the rules, please, judges. Well, the, the, that's my whole point. They're volunteers. Yeah. They're not consistent. It's it's opinionated, subjective judging that is causing a lot of athletes to win or lose that maybe shouldn't be. Right. And then you know? how about calling run out of the way? 
That's that's yeah. It yeah. was like at the Guadalajara. Guadalajara. They were doing laps around the ring. Yeah. And it wasn't being called at all. Right. So anyway, back to how to improve. Okay. This. We went back onto the negative side. Yeah. Of things. We listened to the uh, I think he's the CEO of Dato talk on uh, on Taekwondo podcast being interviewed by Caesar Valentine and. He was an interesting guy, you know, a little stilted in his delivery and very careful because he's representing Dato. But he put out that Generation 2, Dato came along because of the demand that, D that Dato won, the first generation, was awarding points too generously. That wasn't our experience. Gen 1, I think, worked way better than Gen 1. Two. Gen 2, all they needed was a helmet. Yep. So, you know, my view is... And now there's Gen 3 coming yeah. out. So what do people love about... You know, well, you know, normal people, not the intense sports aficionados. What do people in general like about, you know, hockey games, football games, MMA. basketball games, MMA? They want to see a lot of scoring. And knockouts. And like knockouts. they used to be in Taekwondo. Yeah, knockouts, I think, are a little overrated. And that's for people that want to have a bloodlust. But, uh, you know, we don't need knockouts because that's just concussions are a really big deal. That is and true. we don't need concussions with our, especially young athletes. Oh, by the way, if you're over 25, you're not doing international Taekwondo unless you're like Jay Jones and Bianca Walton and people like that because they've accomplished stuff before they're 25. So anyway, it's all young people. But I think lower the thresholds. Yeah. Higher scoring. I want to see 55 to 51 and... And 77 to 71 fights. That would be and, fun. And maybe, you know, maybe the, the judges should be awarding head kicks. Because the face thing is it doesn't work at all. Well, they already the are. Because when the PSS system yeah. doesn't work, the coaches. But see, then you've got like this three people. You've got the system. You've got the yeah, coach. Yeah. You've got the athlete who has to signal to the coach. Yeah. So it's like a four. And then there's a huge delay for the IVR system. Well, it's like a four-person uh telephone game yeah. to get to the actual, oh, did it connect or not? And then you gotta rely on There's the, so the much more downtime yeah. in Taekwondo than any other sport. It's like, like, it's look, ridiculous. Th this last uh, team trials, the, they were standing around on the rings longer than they were actually fighting. Yeah. What was that about? And it wasn't even unusual, that's just normal. So so basically less less downtime reviewing. Yes. That would help. More points. Uh, higher points. Yeah, award more punches. Award more punches, and I think this is just my opinion. I think punches should be worth like a point and a half. A point and a half. You know, it should be worth more than a gamble. It's a digital system. Why can't it do half points? It, it, can. it can. Well, they used to do half point deductions for gamble. Yeah. Yeah. So I think points should be worth a point and a half. Right. Um, and how about uh, gamble? We've got two out of three. Consistent. Two out of three rounds. We've got two minute rounds in seniors. What how about a longer th round? What about yeah? If there were three minutes. How rounds? about three minutes? They, um, I think it was uh, Toby was mentioning that they used to be three three minute rounds. Sure, I don't about, remember that. How about but... three minute rounds? What other sport has a two minute round? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe wrestling does. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, even MMA, they're like five minute rounds. Five minutes of grappling, a, yeah. wrestling, hitting, punching, kicking. Yeah. You know, yeah. stretching. Uh, five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I think they could do three minutes, yeah. and you know that would force a fitness level on the Taekwondo athletes that some of them don't seem to have. Like Guadalajara, I couldn't believe the number of athletes that gassed out just because they're at like 5,000 feet. We live at 6,000 feet and, I, and we do cardio five days a week, 30 minutes. I can guarantee you we're not gonna gas out at 5,000 feet. That is true. <laughs> and they moved the US national team, the academy team from, from Colorado Springs where it's at high altitude. five or 5,500 yeah. feet above sea level to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is probably like 300 feet below sea level. I don't know. It's, it's somewhere in that range. Okay, Dan. We're going to wrap this up. Yes. <laughs> so forget Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> so I think, I think those It's are because some, of the support they're getting from I think that those are group. some great ideas on yeah. how we can, can uh, improve and, you know, let's get other people's ideas. Maybe we can do some more um, surveys on our Facebook site, WT yes. Data and Facts. I wish I knew how to do a survey. I can do that. I Thank can, you. I, you can tell me what to do and I can put it. No, I'm not going to tell you what to do. You can tell me what questions we want to ask. I'll give you ideas. And you okay, can, that yeah. sounds great. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for yeah. this conversation. Oh, thank and you just, very much. I have to announce that, uh, so you're going to be doing a podcast with Caesar Valentine pretty soon. I'm doing a podcast. Well, that's the idea. We'll see how it goes with the pre-interview. Yeah. See if I pass. 
You'll pass. Okay. And what's it about? Uh, I'm asking you, what, what does he want to talk about? We're going to be talking about transgender athletes in Taekwondo. What's the situation? What are the issues? What do we think? What does the data support? The data. And uh, Gotta stick to the data. we're going to be talking about uh, facts. It's going to be interesting. Don't miss it. Yep. I will say some things. We will post uh, the, you know, the date and the time when we find out when it will be aired. Excellent. Okay. All right. Thank you. No problem. That was so good. We're going to have to post it. <laughs>